Plutarch's Lives, translated by John Dryden, revised by Arthur Hugh Clough. We are in our third program of Salon, right? Since the country has but few rivers, lakes, or large springs, and many used wells which they had dug, there was a law made that where there was a public well within the Hippicon, that is, four furlongs, all should draw at that, but when it was farther off, they should try and procure a well of their own, and if they had dug ten fathoms deep and could find no water, they had liberty to fetch a pitcher full of four gallons and a half in a day from their neighbors, for he thought it prudent to make provision against want, but not to supply laziness. He showed skill in his orders about planting, for any one that would plant another tree was not to set it within five feet of his neighbor's field, but if a fig or an olive, not within nine, for the roots spread farther, nor can they be planted near all sorts of trees without damage, for they draw away the nourishment, and in some cases are noxious about, uh, noxious by their Effluvia, he that would dig a pit or a ditch was to dig it at the distance of his own depth from his neighbor's ground, and he that would raise stalks of bees was not to place them within three hundred feet of those which another had already raised. He permitted only oil to be exported, and those that exported any other fruit Archon was solemnly to curse, or else pay a hundred drachmas himself, and this law was written in his first table, and, therefore, let none think it incredible, as some affirm, that the exportation of figs was once unlawful, and the informer against the delinquents called... A psychophant. He made a law also concerning hurts and injuries from beasts, in which he commands the master of any dog that bit a man to deliver him up with a log about his neck, four and a half feet long, a happy device for men's security. The law concerning naturalizing strangers is of a doubtful character. He permitted only those to be made free of Athens, who were in perpetual exile from their own country, or came with their own, their whole family to trade there. This he did, not to discourage strangers, but rather to invite them to a permanent participation in the privileges of the government, and besides, he thought, those would prove the more faithful citizens, who had been forced from their own country, or voluntarily forsook it. The law of public entertainment, Parasitine, is, is named for it, is also peculiarly salons, for if any man came often, or if he that was invited refused, they were punished, for he concluded that one was greedy, the other a contemner of the state, all his laws he established for an hundred years, and wrote them on wooden tables or rollers, namely axons, which might be turned round in oblong cases. Some of their relics were in my time still to be seen in the Pritanium, our common hall at Athens. Those, as Aristotle states, were called Kerbes, Kerbes. and there is a passage of Cretinus, the comedian, by Salon and by Draco, if you please, whose Kerpus made the fires that parch our peas. Some say those are properly Kerpus, which contain laws concerning sacrifices and the rites of religion, and all the others, axons, 
the council all jointly swore to confirm the laws in every one of the thus Matata vowed for himself at the stone in the marketplace, that if he broke any of the statutes, he would dedicate a golden statue as big as himself at Delphi. If you want that statue at Delphi, you know, it's the, I mean, the people who would have wanted that would have known what to do, right? Uh, observing the irregularity of the months, and that the moon does not always rise and set with the sun, but often in the same day overtakes it and gets before him. He ordered the day should be named the old and new, attributing that part of it, which is before the conjunction, to the old moon and the rest to the new, he being the first. It seems that understood that verse of Homer, the end and the beginning of the month. And the following day, he called the new moon. After the 20th, he did not count by addition, but like the moon itself in its wane by subtraction, thus up to the 30th. Now when these laws were enacted, and some came to Salon every day to commend or disparise them, and to advise if possible to leave out or put in something, and many criticized and desired him to explain and tell the meaning of such and such a passage, he knowing that to do it was useless, and not to do it would get him ill will, and desirous to bring himself out of all straits, and to escape all his pleasure and exceptions, it being a hard thing, as he himself says, in great affairs to satisfy all sides. As an excuse for traveling, he bought a trading vessel, and having leave for ten years' absence, departed, hoping that by that time his laws would have become familiar. And in doing that, um, don't fall to some sociopathic thing where you compromise your personal uh, ethics. Um, that, oh, well, I'm going to placate this wrongdoing or this wrong thinking or something because I, you know, I just want everybody pleased with me. No, don't do that. Um, it's one thing, non-participation is like, well, it's going to be done. I you know, don't side with it, but anyways. This is far the thought was, but it came from memory. His first voyage was for Egypt he, as he lived, as he himself says, nearer he lost his mouth by fair Canopsis's shore. And spent some time in study with Senephus of Heliopolis and Sonkis the Sa'it, the most learned of all the priests, from whom, as Plato says, getting knowledge of the Atlantic story, I, I personally look at the Berbers and Egyptians themselves now, but, um, and I believe the Dogon as well, uh, he puts it into a poem and proposed to bring it to the knowledge of the Greeks. From thence he sailed to Cyprus, where he was made much of by Philo Cyprus. One of the kings there. You know, Atlantis is actually the name of a king, um, as they say, um, but the eye of the Sahara, it's not some under island area, and it actually fits Plato's dimensions, if you look at it, um, and Herodotus and a bunch of them know about it, you know, so don't listen to some new age, it's some undersea kingdom that sunk, and no, it's not, 
Um, anyways, he had a small city built by Demophon. Thus, uses his son near the river Clarius, in a strong situation, but incommodious and uneasy of access. Salon persuaded him, since there lay a fair plain below, to remove and build there a pleasanter and more spacious city, and he stayed himself and assisted in gathering inhabitants, and in fitting it both for defense and convenience of living, insomuch that the many flock to Philo Copras, and the other kings imitated the design, and therefore to honor Salon he called the city Sali, which was formerly named Ape A There's a print issue, so I don't know if the last is a ha ah, as well. Um and Salon himself in his elegies. elegies addressing Philo Capras mentions this foundation in these words. Long may you live and fill the Salonian throne, succeeded still by children of your own, and from your happy island while I sail, let Capras send for me a favoring gale. May she advance and bless your new command, prosper your town and send me safe to land, that Salon should discourse with Croesus, some think not agreeable with chronology, but I cannot reject so famous and well attested a narrative, and what is more, so agreeable to Salon's temper, and so worthy his wisdom and greatness of mind, because, forsooth, it does not agree with some chronological canons, which thousands have endeavored to regulate, and yet to this day could never bring their differing opinions to any agreement. They say, therefore, that Salon coming to Croesus, in his request, was in the same condition as an inland man, when first he goes to see the sea, for as he fancies every river he meets with to be the ocean, so Salon, as he passed through the court, and saw a great many nobles richly dressed, and proudly attended with a multitude of guards and footboys, thought every one had been the king, till he was brought to Croesus who was decked with every possible rarity and curiosity in ornaments of jewels, purple and gold, that could make a grand and gorgeous spectacle of him. Now when Salon came before him, and seemed not at all surprised, nor gave Croesus those compliments he expected, but showed himself to all discerning eyes to be a man that despised the gaudiness and petty ostentation of it. He commanded them to open at his treasure houses and carry him to see his sumptuous furniture and luxuries, though he did not wish it, so long could judge of him well enough by the first sight of him, and when he returned from viewing all, Croesus asked him if ever he had known a happier man than he, and when Salon answered that he had known one Tellus, a fellow citizen of his own, and told him that this Tellus had been an honest man, he had good children, a competent estate, and died bravely in battle for his country. Croesus took him for an ill-bred fellow and a fool, for not measuring happiness by the abundance of gold and silver, and preferring the life and death of a private and mean man before so much power and empire. He asked him, however, again, if besides Tellus he knew any other man more happy, and Salon replying, Yes. Cleopis and Beton, who were loving brethren and extremely dutiful sons to their mother, and when the oxen delayed her, harnessed themselves to the wagon and drew her to Juno's temple, her neighbors all calling her happy, and she herself rejoicing. Then, after sacrificing and feasting, they went to rest, and never rose again, but died in the midst of their honor, a painless and tranquil death. What? said Croesus angrily, and dost not thou reckon us amongst the happy men at all? 
well, you can be happy and angry at the same time. Um, Salon, unwilling to either flatter or exasperate him more, replied. The gods, O king, have given the Greeks all other gifts in moderate degree, and so our wisdom, too, is a cheerful and a homily, not a noble and kingly wisdom, and this observing the numerous misfortunes that should attend all conditions forbids us to grow insolent upon our present enjoyments, or to admire any man's happiness that may yet in course of time suffer change, for the uncertain future has yet to come with every possible variety of fortune, and of him only to whom the divinity has continued happiness unto the end we call happy, to salute as happy one that is still in the midst of life and hazard, we think as little safe and conclusive as to crown and proclaim as victorious the wrestler <coughs> that is yet in the ring. After this he was diminished. Uh, he After this he was dismissed, having given Croesus some pain, but no instruction. Asop, who wrote the fables, being then at Sardis upon Proessus's invitation, and very much esteemed, was concerned that Salon was so ill-received, and gave him this advice. Salon, yet your converse with kings be either short or seasonable. Nay, rather, replied Salon, either short or reasonable. So at this time Croesus despised Salon. But when he was overcome by Cyrus which in Kurash is how you pronounce his name in Persian, but um, well, I don't mean Farsi necessarily. I'm not sure how they say it in Farsi, but in, you know, the Persepolis cuneiform and whatnot, um, and in the Bible, too. Uh, well, the Jewish part, anyways. Um, Tars. He lost his city, was taken alive, condemned to be burnt, and laid upon the pile before all the Persians, and Karas himself. He cried out as loud as possibly he could three times, O Salon, and Karas being surprised, and sending some to inquire what man or entity this Salon was, who alone he invoked in this extremity. Croesus told him the whole story, saying he was one of the wise men of Greece, whom I sent for, not to be instructed or learn anything that I wanted, but that he should see and be a witness of my happiness, the loss of which was, it seems, to be a greater evil than the enjoyment was a good, for when I had them, they were goods only in opinion, but now the loss of them has brought upon me intolerable and real evils, and he conjecturing from what then was this that now is bade look to the end of my life and not really and grow proud upon uncertainties when this was told Karas, who was a wiser man than Croesus, you know because cyrus was seen as the messiah um you know and who knows how many official messiahs there were um and saw in the present example Salon's maxim confirmed, he not only freed Croesus from punishment, but honored him as long as he lived, and Salon had the glory, by the same saying, to save one king and instruct another. And Cyrus the Great appears, you know, the king of the two horns, appears to be the Karnain in Surah 18 of the Quran, and, um, some side sayings, um, not side sayings is probably the wrong word, but um, there wasn't, in, in the Islamic uh, situation, they didn't have, um, you know, they had the revelation, they had the inspiration, and the inspiration was kept as a separate category. In the Bible, you have claims to revelation, claims to inspiration, um, sacred history, and opinions of scholars, all mixed into one. Um, and then edited and edited and edited and put in different languages. And um, 
Of course, the Persians are very essential to the composition of the Bible because uh, many, a, a lot of books in Tanakh are rewrites of stuff that was in Persian. It's, there was stuff referenced that were that was in cuneiform that was bigger than the entire Bible, so-called Old and so-called New Testament included. Um, but that's not going to go into much more elsewhere. But um, anyways, when Salon was gone, the citizens began to quarrel. Lycurgus headed the plain. Megacles, the son of Ma'an those to the seaside, and Pisistratus, the hill party, in which were the poorest people, the Thets, and greatest enemies to the rich, insomuch that through the city still used the new laws, yet all looked for and desired a change of government, hoping severely that the change would be better for them and put them above the contrary faction. Affairs standing thus, Salon returned and was reverenced by all and honored, but his old age would not permit him to be as active and to speak in public as formerly, yet by privately conferring with the heads of the factions, he endeavored to compose the differences, peace istratus appearing the most tractable, for he was extremely smooth and engaging in his language, a... great friend of the poor, and moderate in his resentments, and what nature had not given him, he had the skill to imitate, so that he was trusted more than the others, being accounted a prudent and orderly man, one that loved equality, and would be an enemy to any one that moved against the present settlement, and thus he deceived the majority of people, but Salon quickly discovered his character and found out his design before anyone else, yet did not hate him upon this, but endeavored to humble him and bring him off from his ambition, and often told him and others that if any one could banish the passion for preeminence from his mind and cure him of his desire of absolute power, none would make a more virtuous man or a more excellent citizen. Thespis at this time beginning to act tragedies, and it was not yet made a matter of competition, Salon being by nature fond of hearing and learning something new, and now, in his old age, living idly and enjoying himself, indeed with music and with wine, went to see this piece himself, as the ancient custom was, act, and after the play was done, he addressed him and asked him if he was not ashamed to tell so many lies before such a number of people, and thus peace replying that it was no harm to say or do in play, Salon vehemently struck his staff against the ground. Ah, said he, if we honor and commend such play as this, we shall find it some day in our business. Now when Peace Istratus, having wounded himself, was brought into the marketplace in a chariot, and stirred up the people, as if he had been thus treated by his opponents because of his political conduct, and a great many were enraged and cried out, Salon, coming close to him, said, This, O son of Hippocrates, is a bad copy of Homer's Alasis. Alasis. You do to trick your countrymen, what he did to deceive his enemies. Now, I'm, I don't remember how to say, how, how it's spelt in Greek, but I presume that Ulysses is probably pronounced different than, you know, that Latin-based pronunciation there. Um, after this, the people were eager to protect Pisistratus and met in an assembly, where one Ariston making a motion that they should allow Pis Istratus, fifty clubmen, for a guard to his person. Salon opposed it, and said much to the same purport as 
what he has left us in his poems. You dote upon his words and taking phrase, and again, true you are singly each a crafty soul, but altogether make one empty full. But observing the poor men bent to gratify Pisistratus and Tumultuous, and the rich fearful and getting out of harm's way, he departed, saying, He was wiser than some and stouter than others, wiser than those that did not understand the design, stouter than those that, though they understood it, were afraid to oppose the tyranny. Now the people, having passed the law, were not nice with Pisistratus about the number of his clubmen, but took notice but took no notice of it, though he enlisted and kept as many as he would until he seized the Acropolis, when that was done, and the city in a in an uproar, Megacles, with all his family, at once fled. But Salon, though he was now very old and had none to back him, yet came into the marketplace and made a speech to the citizens, partly blaming their inadvertency and meanness of spirit, and in part urging and exhorting them, not thus, tamely to lose their liberty, and likewise then spoke that memorable saying, that before it was an easier task to stop the rising tyranny, but now the great and more glorious action to destroy it, when it was begun already, and had gathered strength, but all being afraid to side with him, he returned home, and taking his arms, he brought them out, and laid them in the porch before his door. With these words I have done my part, to maintain my country and my laws. But then he busied himself no more, his friends advising him to fly, he refused, but wrote poems, and thus reproached the Athenians in them. If now you suffer, do not blame the powers, for they are good, and all the fault was ours. All the strongholds you put into his hands, and now his slaves must do what he commands. And many telling him that the tyrant would take his life for this, and asking what he trusted to, that he ventured to speak so boldly, he replied, To my old age, but Pisistratus, having got the command, so extremely courted Salon, so honored him, obliged him, and sent to see him, that Salon gave him his advice, and approved many of his actions, for he retained most of Salon's laws, observed them himself, and compelled his friends to obey, and he himself, though already absolute ruler, being accused of murder before the Areopagus came quietly to clear himself, but his accuser did not appear, and he added other laws, one of which is that the maimed in the war should be maintained at the public charge. This Heraclides Ponticus records, and that Pisistratus followed Salon's example. In this, who had decreed it in the case of one Thersippus that was maimed, and Theophrastus asserts that it was Pisistratus, not Salon, that made the law against laziness, which was the reason that the country was more productive and the city tranquiller. Now Salon, having begun the great work in verse, the history or fable of the Atlantic island, which he had learned from the wise men in Sais, and thought convenient for the Athenians to know, abandoned it, not as Plato says by reason of want of time, but because of his age and being discouraged at the greatness of the task, for that he had leisure enough. Such verses testify as each day grow older and learn something new, and again, but now the powers of beauty, song, and wine, which are most men's delights, are also mine. Plato, willing to improve the story of the Atlantic island, as if it were a fair estate that wanted an heir and came with some title to him, 
formed indeed stately entrances, noble enclosures, large courts such as never yet introduced any story, fable, or poetic fiction, but beginning it late ended his life before his work, and the reader's regret for the unfinished part is the greater, and the satisfaction he takes in that which is complete is extraordinary, for as the city of Athens left only the temple of Jupiter, Olympias, Olympias, unfinished, so Plato, amongst all his excellent works, left this only piece about the Atlantic island imperfect. Solon lived after Pisistratus seized the government. As Heraclitus Ponticus asserts, a long time, but Phanius the Aresian says, not two full years for Pisistratus began his tyranny when Commius was Archon, and Phanius says that Solon died under Hegestratus, who succeeded Commius. The story that his ashes were scattered about the island of Salamis is too strange to be easily believed or be thought anything but a mere fable. And yet it is given amongst other good authors by Aristotle the philosopher. And I guess, yeah, there's not enough space to start with. Poplicola. Publicola. Um, 